Good morning. We're just testing the audio. That seemed to work on my end. I could uh, I could hear that one. Okay, Tanya, I don't know whether you can put in the chat room whether you can hear. Okay. Okay, we're going to get things started in a minute. Uh, so I'll go back on mute for a minute. Okay, good morning. I think we'll get things underway. Uh, thanks for joining us. I'm Scott McCammon, uh, President and CEO of the, uh, the Milton Chamber of Commerce. And I want to thank everyone who's joining us today on the webinar and also for those that are joining us on your TV. Uh, we're very fortunate again uh, to have Doug Suley joining us for another COVID conversation. Uh, today we're talking about understanding the safety protocols in the second wave, uh, which unfortunately we're in now, but uh, a very important topic. Uh, and as I put in the chat room, just a reminder that if you do have questions, uh, just put them in the chat and we'll deal with those afterwards. We're also fortunate this morning to have Evan Holt from MPP Parm Gill's office. Um, after Doug's presentation, Evan will just do a short update on uh, on the uh, subsidies that are available for, uh, for safety and PPE, things like that. Uh, so as you know, uh, the pandemic has created a number of challenges, one of which is operating safely uh, so that our customers and our staff are, uh, are kept safe uh, in, our, in our businesses. And the challenge that we have too is that the protocols change daily, hourly. So it's very difficult for, uh, for business people to keep up with everything that's going on. So having someone with Doug's expertise is even more valuable. Just a little bit of a background, uh, Doug's the owner and lead consultant for Suli Safety Services, which started in March of 2015, uh, to offer health and safety training and consulting services to small business. Um, Doug graduated from Brock University in 2007 and has worked in various sectors, including lumber, transportation, construction, warehousing, logistics, uh, but all, always in a workplace uh, safety role, including joint health and safety committees and managing health and safety programs in the workplace. So definitely uh, an expert that we have with us today. So Doug, thanks for joining us and I'll let you take it from here. Okay, thanks Scott. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's been keeping safe and healthy and well during these crazy times. Um, today we're going to talk about um, the health and safety protocols currently for all workplaces and in Ontario. Um, I did do this presentation not too long ago. However, what I've decided today is to concentrate on some of the recent changes. Um, so as you'll see through the presentation, we will touch on a little bit of everything, but I will be concentrating on a couple of areas that have changed recently. So we'll talk about uh, due diligence, liability. We'll talk about good faith. The Ontario government has made an announcement with regards to liability for businesses. 
Uh, we'll talk about regulations and guidelines and workplace compliance, and then we'll get into the recent changes, which are specifically screening measures and your mask and face coverings. We'll also touch briefly on some of the other measures, including cleaning, signage, physical distancing, PPE, training, and isolation. And we'll finally finish with some enforcement concerns, including set fines and the Ministry of Labor and their role in all of this. So let's start with due diligence. Um, there is a clause in the Health and Safety Act for Ontario that is very important for all employers to be aware of. This is that the employer must do everything reasonable under the circumstance to protect the health and safety of the workers. Um, when it comes down to liability for an employer, they need to be able to prove without a shadow of a doubt that they've done everything they can to protect their workers. Um, the employer does have ultimate responsibility to protect their workers, as well as make sure that their clients, when they come into their workplace, are also protected. Um, this is very important to be aware of and you can be found liable if workers or clients are getting sick. Uh, you can also be found liable under health and safety laws, civil suits and WSIB. Um, I have dealt with a few clients that uh, have been fined quite significantly for health and safety violations. Part of the reason why I've been going in there to help them. Uh, some of them range from around 25,000 and up to about 150,000 was the largest fine that I've seen for a client that I've worked with. Um, we have been able to make improvements in those workplaces, of course, um, but we'd like to see you guys, any workplace avoid those. So you can also end up in jail uh, for health and safety violations as well. And it would be under the criminal code. And you could have civil, set, civil suits and settlements that could cost significant amount of money for a business, a lot more than a business can usually handle. So Ontario not too long ago has started talking about providing COVID-19 liability protection to businesses, workers, and some organizations. Uh, the legislation would protect those who take honest measures to follow public health guidelines. The bill, if it's passed, will ensure anyone making an honest effort to follow the public health guidelines while they are working or volunteering will not be exposed to liability in civil proceedings. However, the bill will not prevent lawsuits against those who willfully or through gross negligence endanger others. This is not something that has been put in to legislation. It is still being discussed at this point, but it is something that I think can help businesses realize that if they do make an honest effort, um, the fear of liability and lawsuits could be significantly reduced. Um, it is also there to make sure that the people, the bad actors, as they like to say, the bad actors can be punished, whether it's through government intervention or whether it is through civil suits. The regulation that was recently passed was Regulation 364.20, which is the rules for areas in Stage 3 under the Reopening Ontario, a flexible response to COVID-19 Act for this year. It was developed in response to the recent rise of COVID-19 cases in Ontario. As you are aware, we had our first wave back in March that lasted well into the summer. And we had a period where cases went significantly down, where I believe at one point our lowest case count was around 55 or 60. Uh, we were doing fairly well. Um, I do believe a lot of people are doing well. There are some people not so much. But unfortunately, with the flu season and the colder weather coming in, the cases have shot back up significantly, which was fairly expected. Um, this act was put in and regulation was put into place to require businesses and organizations to comply with any advice, recommendations and instructions that are issued by the Ministry of Health. Um, I have provided a link here to the actual regulation. If you'd like to have a read and maybe put your glasses on because the font's usually very small, please feel free to do so. But I will try to summarize some of the things in the regulation today. A couple of the main points and will lead into our recent changes include on September 26th, the Ministry of Health released a screening tool 
that is required to be used by all workplaces for their workers and essential visitors. And October 2nd, they require the mask and face covering requirements for indoor spaces was updated as well. The Ministry of Labour, Training and Skills Development has released up to 200 sector specific guidelines for businesses to use to help them reopen or to maintain operation during COVID-19. I have provided a link as well. Um, and as I said in the chat, I will actually provide these links in the chat session so that each of you can have a, access to them. Uh, the hope is with the sector specific guidelines is that you will use the guidelines that apply to your industry as a starting point. The purpose of the guideline is to provide you with measures you can put into place to help protect your workers as well as your clients if you do have a business where clients come in. Um, the ministry has also provided a COVID-19 safety plan document. It is actually a document that I have used with a lot of my clients to set up their COVID-19 response and pandemic planning for their workplace. It just reviews and discusses different requirements for the workplace and develops these measures to combat COVID-19. Um, I strongly suggest that you download a copy of the document and complete it. Um, it will provide you with a very good starting point and basis to be able to implement measures that'll help you protect your workers. Workplaces must, and employers for that matter, must develop COVID-19 uh, COVID policy and safe practices. And they must also develop pandemic preparedness policies for not only right now with COVID-19, but also into the future for any future pandemics that may arise. These practices that must be included include cleaning, signage, screening measures, physical distancing, PPE, including masks, training for workers, as well as isolation and containment measures. Uh, we will touch on each of these, a couple, most of them briefly, but we will touch on the recent changes for screening and masks in a lot more detail. So let's get into the recent changes. So for screening, there's been two types of screening. You have your active screening and your passive screening. Passive screening is posting signage at your front door, posting signage throughout the workplace, um, asking your employees to self assess themselves in the morning, um, asking them to report symptoms to you under good faith. Um, and active screening is a little more in depth. This has includes the questionnaires and temperature checks. A lot of workplaces have put thermometers into their workplaces and are taking temperatures of customers as they come in. Uh, you do need to make sure you maintain documentation for all screening that is completed. And it is a good idea if you don't already to have a sign in and check sheet that also collects visitor information, especially regular and essential visitors to your workplace. This has to, this helps with the contact tracing. So in September, on September 25th, for the effective date of September 26th, the ministry, the regulation was put into place and requires that the Ministry of Health recommends use of screening tools to complete, be completed by any worker or essential visitor before or when they enter the workplace. This basically requires employers to perform screening uh, more active screening for their employees, as well as essential visitors. There is a link here to the actual screening tool. And as I said, I will put it in the chat as well. So workers will include all staff, including students, contractors, and volunteers. And your essential visitors include any individual providing a service or in the establishment who is not an employee or a client of the establishment. The screening tool does not need to be completed by clients or patrons or emergency and first responders when they enter the workplace. However, keep in mind, depending on the industry you are in, you do need to collect certain information from your clients, such as restaurants, collecting contact information for contact tracing purposes. So the screening questions, there's basically three screening questions that are required. 
The first one is, do you have any of the following new or worsening symptoms or signs that are not chronic or related to an other known cause or condition? This includes fever or chills, difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, a cough, sore throat or trouble swallowing, a runny nose, stuffy nose or nasal congestion, a decrease or, a, or loss of smell or taste, any nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or abdominal pain, or any general not feeling well, extreme tiredness, or sore muscles. You also need to confirm that a person has not traveled outside of Canada within the past 14 days, and they have not had co close contact with a confirmed or probable case of COVID-19. So you can use the tool that they have provided, but you can also have the questions posted in your workplace at the entrance and ensure that everybody completes the necessary screening, whether it's through a checklist or a sign-in sheet. Um, there are different options that you can use. The screening must occur either before or when an enter a worker or essential visitor enters the workplace at the beginning of their day or shift. Um, this, there is no requirement specific to how the tool must be completed. So as I said, you can have a, a document posted at your entrance that asks these questions and a visitor may check off on your sign-in sheet that says they have completed the screening measures. You could, for your workers, you could have it through their sign-in when they sign in every morning. Um, you could also send it by email in advance or just have the checklist available at your reception. Uh, you should keep the records for a minimum of 30 days. Uh, this helps with any contact tracing that might be required if there is an outbreak. But these records must be kept confidential due to privacy laws and concerns. So we've gone over a little bit of screening there. So let's talk about masks. Um, October 2nd, the government released a guideline stating that masks must be worn in all public indoor spaces. Um, this mask can be a non-medical surgical mask or a cloth mask as well. Uh, these must be worn in any public space, in any workplace that is open and not open to the public, or any vehicle that may operate as a business such as a taxi or ride share, as well as your public transit as well. You do not need to wear a face covering when you're working in an area that allows you to maintain a distance of at least two meters or six feet from anyone else while you're indoors. You can also temporarily take off your face covering if you're receiving services requiring the removal of a mask. This could be a haircut or um, any sort of beauty work. Uh, engaged in an athletic or fitness activity or eating or drinking. If there is a health and safety concern that requires you to take off the mask temporarily, you are permitted to do that as well. There are some exemptions. Uh, any child under two years old is not required to wear a mask. If you have a medical condition, you do not have to wear a mask and you do not have to provide documentation. If you are inside of a correctional institution, or working inside a correctional institution, you're working inside the custody program for a young person in conflict with the law, a detention program for young persons in conflict with the law, university dorms, retirement homes, and long-term care homes or other similar dwellings, except if you are in the common area and you cannot maintain two meters or six feet of distance. In residence for people with disabilities, unless again, you are in a common area, and performing or rehearsing for a film or television production, concert, artistic event, or theatrical performance. So we'll talk, let's get into talking about the fit. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen out in public, in a workplace, um, there's a variety of different ways that people like to wear their masks. Uh, there really is only one way for the mask to be worn where it actually provides protection. And again, you don't wear a mask to protect yourself. You wear a mask to protect other people around you. 
Um, the mask must fit securely to your head with ties or ear loops. It must maintain its shape after washing and drying. It must be a minimum of two layers of tightly woven material, such as a cotton or a linen, and it must be large enough to comfortably and completely cover your nose and mouth. So your mask should basically come up above your nose and around and come below your chin. This ensures you have proper protection for your nose as well as your mouth. When you're using a mask, you should always make sure it's important to wash your hands, um, not only before you put the mask on, but immediately after you take the mask off. Um, I actually take an extra step myself and I actually wash my hands before I take the mask off as well. Um, you should always try to avoid touching the mask or touching your face, moving or adjusting the mask. Don't share your mask with others. And you should always try and you should always change your mask if it's slightly wet or dirty. And whenever you throw it, remove your mask, if it is disposable, you should throw it out into a lined garbage bin. Wash your hands and please don't leave it in shopping carts or on the ground. Um, I believe that we already have enough litter throughout the public. We don't need to have any additional ones because of the masks. If you are wearing a mask, please take it off and throw it out in the proper garbage bin. If, you're if your face covering or mask can be cleaned, many of them now, unless it's the non-surgical mask, can be cleaned. Put it directly into the washing machine or a bag that can be emptied into the washing machine. Wash it with other items, including a hot cycle with laundry detergent. You don't need to use any special soaps though. Dry it thoroughly and wash your hands after putting the face covering into the laundry. And any face covering that cannot be cleaned should be thrown out and replaced as soon as they get slightly wet, dirty, or crumpled. So we've kind of gone over the two main changes. So let's talk about some of the other measures. I'll touch on these briefly. So the first one is extremely important. It's probably the best way to prevent yourself from catching COVID-19. Uh, physical distancing. In the beginning, we used to call it social distancing. I think we wanted to kind of put it as a nice way to say, you know, you need to stay six feet apart. But as we saw that the cases started to rise in the first wave, we realized, well, we just need to be blunt and upfront and say, just stay away from people. So you must always maintain six feet or two meters of distance when you're in a workplace. Some of the tips that allow you to do this include rearranging, reconfiguring or reorganizing work areas, minimizing your clients and customers within your facility, minimizing workers in each work area where possible, staggering breaks and lunches to reduce workers, staggering shifts and minimizing staff on shifts, always allowing and continuing your workers where possible to work from home and placing mark, place markings on the floor to show six feet of distance and installing and using your plexiglass in any cash service or reception areas. So these are some of the measures you can do to help maintain six feet, but you can't always do this. There's a lot of different types of tasks, different industries, different workplaces where six feet of distance, it just doesn't happen. Uh, you see this in construction, you see this in uh, food production plants where they have lines set up and unfortunately they just can't maintain six feet. Um, some of the tips you can use include installing plexiglass or barriers to separate workers and workstations, staggering breaks and lunches to reduce workers in the area, minimizing your clients and customers in the workplace, setting up other arrangements such as outdoor spaces, although unfortunately as we get into the fall and winter, that's not really gonna be possible because eating outside at 20, minus 20 is not really gonna be all that fun. Um, and making sure workers wear proper personal protective equipment. Um, there is talk about face shields, but the important one is definitely masks. Whenever, you also need to make sure that you're cleaning the workplace. Uh, right now, you should look at high use areas and high touch areas and increase the frequency of your cleaning. 
This could be your offices, washrooms, and lunchrooms. And you should must clean and sanitize high touch areas frequently. This includes door handles, desks and equipment, workstations. Um, it's a good idea to set up a schedule and monitoring checklist just to show that one, you have designated workers that may perform this. You may ask your workers to clean their own workstation. Um, this could be something as simple as just wiping it down and providing um, Lysol or sanitizing wipes for them to do that. Um, or if you have a cleaning company, you may consider the idea of having them come in additional. There is certainly a cost to that. Uh, but the idea is to make sure your high frequently used areas and high touch areas are cleaned more frequently. Um, some of the basics, hand washing. Hand washing is the best way to wash off any sort of potential COVID that might be on your hands. Um, please use soap and hot water and always make sure it's 20 seconds minimum. So when you wash your hands, you always want to rub your hands in front, get between your fingers, around your thumbs and your fingernails. Um, some people will use a variety of different ways to ensure they do 20 seconds. I like to say, just sing happy birthday twice. Try not to sing it too loud because I don't know, some people might look at you funny. Um, you should also make sure that there's signs for hand washing posted in all areas where there's washing that takes place. So this is your washrooms or if you have any wash stations throughout your facility. You should set up sanitizer at all entrances. Make sure people use it prior to entering the facility. Um, keep it well stocked. I like to say a minimum of a half in any sort of container. Reinforce hand washing with soap and water. Um, sanitizer only works up to a certain point. And always make sure your sanitizer meets Health Canada standards. I know in the beginning, a lot of people, there was a shortage and a lot of people were looking at all kinds of different sanitizers being used. Um, there are a lot that actually have been recalled and I have provided a link to the approved hand sanitizers that you can use from the national or Canada's public health. Again, I will post the links into the chat area so that you'll be able to access them. You need to post signing signage throughout the facility. So signage such as physical distancing, uh, make sure you post this quite, quite a few of them. Uh, don't really skimp out on these. I have had a couple of instances where the ministry has come in and even though we've had a couple at a front entrance, one in a work area, they actually told us it wasn't enough. So we had to post significantly more. Um, hand washing and sanitizing. Make sure you have these signs posted in your washrooms, reception, and in main areas. And your screening reminders and reporting symptoms requirement. So a lot of the local public health units will have a poster available that is specific to their region. I would find this poster and post that at every entrance. Um, you also should have a sign that says you must wear masks when you enter this facility. And the ministry has provided sector specific signs that are available to use for additional signage such as cleaning and sanitizing as well. And again, I have provided a link and the link will be provided to you in the chat. So let's talk about some of the other PPE. Um, face shields. Face shields do not replace masks when physical distancing is not possible. The face shield can be an additional measure on top of the mask. Um, however, I would make sure that anybody doing screening, if they are taking a temperature, if there's no barrier that has been put up, that they wear a mask and face shield while performing this. Gloves, you can use nitrile or latex gloves, but they do not replace hand washing and sanitizing. And I find the issue with gloves is you're taking them on and off. And if you take them off, you have to dispose of them and you can go through gloves pretty quickly. Um, you must still, from a health and safety standpoint, you must still make sure, depending on your workplace requirements, you must make sure you're still wearing safety boots. 
your hard hats, your vests, your eye protection and ear protection. These are all requirements of the health and safety acts. And just because COVID has come in, it does not mean that those do no, no longer apply. So as I said, the mask and face coverings. So on Friday, October 2nd, the government of Ontario mandated the use of face coverings in indoor premises and all businesses and organizations. A non-surgical mask, mask or cloth face covering is okay. Uh, try and save N95s for healthcare workers and first responders. However, if there is a task that you are completing that requires you to use an N95 or higher grade mask, then you must make sure that you have those and you must make sure your workers are using them. This could be working with chemicals and dust, for example. Um, and always make sure that the masks fit each worker. Um, giving someone a mask that basically hangs off their face where they constantly have to adjust it, uh, you need to find, they need to find a smaller mask that fits their face. Workers, it's important to not only put these measures in place, but it's important to make sure that you train your workers. So workers must receive training on the actual COVID information provided as well as the symptoms how to make sure they self-assess and where to get that information, making sure that they are wearing their mask and how to properly wear the mask. Um, I think it's going to be very important as we move forward that all businesses have a document that shows that they've shown all of their workers how to wear a mask properly. It may see some, seem something very trivially, trivial, but unfortunately, I think that's going to go a long way towards the liability issues. Um, hand washing and sanitizing, showing them how to properly wash their hands, physical distancing, talking about physical distancing and what's been put into place, how to report symptoms and concerns. So you also need to have additional information on what to do if someone does report symptoms. If someone reports symptoms, you need to isolate them and you need to ask them to go home and to call their pub local public health. Um, the local public health will provide additional information on whether they're required to be tested or not. If you have someone who's been exposed, or if you have someone who has a family member who's been exposed, they'll also provide you guidance on what you need to do. And they do actually reach out to you, especially when it comes to contact tracing. Where to get more information on COVID-19 and also communicate with them the importance that they do still have the right to refuse unsafe work. If they feel that they are not safe, they do have a right to refuse that work. Um, you should always make sure you train them when they start and also do regular reminders. A great way to do regular reminders is through safety talks or bulletin board talks. This could be something that's a simple five, 10 minute conversation held at a regular frequency that reiterates the training that you've provided them in the past, um, not only for COVID measures, but your health and safety measures as well. So we'll finish up with some enforcement concerns. And let's talk about the enforcement concerns with regards to COVID specifically. So. Any failure to comply with the Reopening Ontario Act is an offence which you may be liable on conviction to a fine of $750 up to $500,000 and a term of imprisonment of not more than one year. It is an offence under the Health Protection and Promotion Act for which you may be liable on conviction to a fine of up to $5,000 for every day or part of the day on which the offence occurs or continues. So. I don't know about any of you, but I don't have that kind of money. So I like to really try and make sure that I comply with the Health Canada and Ontario Public Health Guidelines. With regards to the Ministry of Labour Training and Skills Development, um, they are continuing to hire more inspectors. I believe the last count they had hired 99 new inspectors and they are carrying the largest amount of inspectors that they've ever carried. Uh, these inspector, inspectors will visit your workplace to check on COVID-19 compliance, but always keep in mind, a Ministry of Labour inspector will come in and as soon as they see something, they will start to look for something else. Their role in this is to always enforce, 
the Health and Safety Act. And it is almost always unannounced. It is very rare that they will let you know that they are coming in. If there is a concern that is found, they will issue notice of compliance orders, stop work orders and fines. And I can guarantee you, they will come back to check. So they will not just come in and issue an order and you sign the order and send it back. They will come back to check to make sure that you've actually implemented what you've said. So always make sure that regardless of whether we're in COVID or not, make sure you keep your COVID measures up to date, but also make sure you keep your health and safety measures up to date as well. It's important to make sure your workers are kept safe. So a couple of the links here, and again, I will post these in the chat. Uh, the Ministry of Labor Training and Skills Development, I've provided their homepage. And any contact, the contact number for any questions, reports, or complaints is 1-877-202-0008. Complaints can be made confidentially as well. Public Health, I've provided their website, Health Canada, and the Ontario Government COVID Response page. And finally, some information about myself. Um, I have been working with a lot of companies in the last six months and further in regards to helping them implement COVID, helping them monitor COVID. And I am more than happy to come in and discuss any questions that you may have. Um, I also offer, as Scott said, I do offer a lot of training services, both in a warehouse construction environment and I offer a lot of consulting services, including my site visits service and auditing and program creation and maintenance. So if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me by phone, email. You can contact me through the website and you can also follow me on social media where I post lots of tips and information on health and safety matters you can apply to your business. Okay, thank you. That's great. Thank you, Doug. Uh, we're going to get to uh, questions in a minute. And a reminder to everyone, uh, if you do have questions, put them in the in the chat area. Uh, before we get to the Q&A, though, I want to turn it over to Evan Holt just to, uh, to give us an update on some of the government subsidies. Sure. Thanks, Scott. Um, so I, I think as reiterated, my name is Evan. I, um, I work in uh, the MPP office here in Milton. Um, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to go into the, the details that, that Doug provided. He, I, I don't have his experience or, or pedigree when it comes to the uh, work and safety parameters that we should all be operating under. Um, I think what I may try to do is just reiterate um, some of the, or try and emphasize some of the points that, that uh, Doug was making, and in particular, um, recognizing that there is an onus of responsibility for keeping employers safe. Um, and a big thing, again, that I think Doug was reiterating is having a plan in place, a workplace safety plan, not necessarily just for um, the day-to-day -day actions, but obviously one that relates to, to COVID-19. Um, and I think also what was reiterated is that the province um, has done uh, their best to try and provide sector-by-sector -sector guidelines in terms of uh, things to be considered and reviewed as a sort of a bare minimum standard um, that employers would need to oblige to. Uh, so if there is you know, any questions about that, happy to get into that in a, you know, as we get into the Q&A and, and maybe provide some resources that way. Um, but the major thing, again, about having those plans in place is um, that the province is working to uh, revise the liability um, parameters when it comes to the transference of COVID-19 in the workplace. Um, again, we are trying to increase the threshold, but uh, it does not guarantee absolute immunity. So um, again, as I think was reiterated, uh, you want to make sure that you can prove beyond a doubt that you were doing every action possible to, to keep your, your workers safe. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, again, there isn't this, this sort of negligence of the health, health and safety protocols that, that should be implemented. Um, because, again, you can still be found liable. There is no uh, full immunity to, to these issues. Um, and it's something that I think, you know, again, as business owners and employers, uh, everybody needs to, to be cognizant of. Um, there are also some ways to help above and beyond the, uh, the sector by sector guidelines. Um, I know part of what the, the province has tried to do with our uh, Main Street Recovery Act, and I'll get into that briefly in just a quick second, um, is we are trying to um, build up the, uh, the knowledge, if you will, um, and the, and the um, guidance that should be in place within our small businesses through the small business enterprise centers. So we are giving them more 
uh, more resources, more uh, more people, more boots on the ground in these centers to again try and provide resources, very specific resources to your business. Um, and the one for Halton Region is actually in Oakville, so not uh, not too far away. And again, if there is um, any interest in trying to contact that uh, local enterprise center, happy to to try and provide that that information to you. Um, Again, just sort of building on the, the the safety element, the province does have uh, a workplace PPE directory. Again, um, we we heard loud and clear from from Doug that uh, you know it's important to have your uh, to comply with um, these these guidelines. And PPE obviously goes a long way uh, in keeping people safe, not just the shields. Again, but obviously making sure you have a mask that fits, um, that you have the sanitizing stations, you have the cleaning materials, um, everything like that. So again, Ontario does have uh, a workplace PPE directory. Um, and Scott, I know the, the chamber here in Milton also has a great local PPE resource um, as well. So if anybody is having any difficulties or challenge obtaining PPE or just uh, knowing where to find it, um, you know, again, there are some resources in place that, that, can, uh, that can help you in, in this for, you know, again, finding this for, for yourself and for um, your employees as well. Um, and obviously there are costs when it comes to, to PPE. And uh, one of the major things I wanted to try and drive home here is that the province is uh, is moving forward with their Main Street Recovery Act. So one of the key features of that um, is actually a grant for PPE. But another uh, great thing too, as uh, we've just sort of seen load up on the screen here is it does include a uh, business recovery webpage. And uh, the idea here is it'll, it's sort of a one-stop shop window to provide a lot of the resources that I think small businesses in our community needs. I mean, it's, it's a, uh, the, uh, COVID-19 by definition is, is evolving, it's changing, um, and you know, it can be hard to keep up with some of the, not only the policies, but some of the support programs and maybe tax benefits that are in place to again aid um, small business recovery and obviously keep those doors open and those lights on. Um, and so again, this, um, this small business recovery webpage uh, will go a long way to just making sure that everybody on this call stays in the know um, and that you can obviously adapt and react quickly to the, the evolving nature of, uh, of this pandemic. Um, I think another thing too is certainly stay tuned on is um, the, uh, the province's uh, budget will be coming forward next week on the 5th. Um, now, I don't know all the ins and outs in terms of what's being included on that, but I know the, both uh, the Minister of Finance and the Premier um, have stated that it will look to build on our COVID economic recovery. So some of the supports that were outlined uh, when the pandemic first came forward, it's going to look to expand upon those um, and obviously build upon uh, that foundation. Now, again, in terms of monies or grants or whatever the case may be, being allotted to small businesses in particular, as I mentioned, I, I truthfully don't know, um, but certainly something to stay tuned for because the expectation is that there will be something there that can, uh, that can help um, everybody, whether, again, it's a, a family, small business, or something in between. That's perfect. Thank you, Evan. Uh, Doug, I know you've answered the, the one question in the chat, but uh, maybe for, uh, for the benefit of uh, the audience, you can just talk about how long people need to keep their records. Sure. Um, in some cases, it's been mentioned 30 days for contract, contact tracing purposes. This could be your signing sheets and stuff. But to me, I think the be you're better served to keep these records for at least a period of one year but I think you're probably even better to keep them for the entire period that this pandemic occurs. Um, now, whether you can store them electronically so you don't have a massive amount of paper in your workplace, um, but I think the longer you have them, the better, especially as we don't know how long this is going to last. And you might you don't know how far back they may be looking. They haven't really said too much, but a minimum of one year is a pretty good standard to start with. I would imagine too, you know, once you keep the records for a year, then, you know, you would uh, not just be throwing that information into the, the normal garbage. You'd probably have to shred that information. Yeah. Um, I know if you have the capability of scanning into a server or anything like that, it would be a good idea to do something like that. A lot of smaller business, like even myself, like I use OneDrive or I use uh, Google Docs or Dropbox and they have plenty of space to be able to store some of these records. Um, so if you don't have a server, or you don't have that capability, I would strongly consider something like that and keeping them or even on a USB stick or something. Just you're better off to have them than to turn around and say, well, we, were do we have been doing this for this long 
but not have any records to show for it. And during the webinar, Doug's been mentioning that he's uh, put the information into the, into the chat area, all the different links. Um, this webinar is also being recorded and will be on the Chamber website. So if, uh, if you miss those links, then you can just access the webinar afterwards. Uh, Doug, I was talking to a company the other day and, and the, the, the idea of the screening questions came up and you were talking about those in the webinar and sort of talking about the different items that uh, people should be asking about. This business was told by the, 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 uh, the region's Department of Health that they can't ask some of the questions because it, uh, it, it kind of covers, it, it goes over into privacy issues. So asking someone if they have diarrhea you know, is now is now more of a privacy issue. So where are you hearing that anywhere else or, or what, what's the kind of the balance between, you know, the privacy versus, you know, the common need for contact tracing? Um, I think at this point, I'm really looking at what the government has put into place. The Ontario government has been, I mean, they've made it pretty clear that they want these questions asked. I can understand, I guess there are some privacy concerns. Nobody really wants to say, well, you know, I didn't have a good morning or something like that or a good afternoon. But at the same time, um, if these are new symptoms, then they do need to be communicated and they maybe not have to be communicated like, you know, with detail, of course, but at least be communicated to say that, hey, you know what, some of these symptoms, this is not something that's normal. Um, I probably shouldn't be, I shouldn't be coming in. A lot of your, you know, as an employer, you also need to make sure that you communicate with your workers that they do need to self, they need to self-assess themselves before they come into work. So whether this is communicating with them to say, you know, you need to make sure if you have these symptoms, you do not come in. And all you need to do is advise us that you don't, you have some of these symptoms and that you're going to stay home and get further advice from public health. Um, they do have an assessment tool as well, online, a self-assessment tool on the Ontario government Ministry of Health website that you can have workers use as well. But this tool that I've provided today is more for the employer to make sure that one, they are performing those screening measures um, a lot of employers have looked at it and say, well, we do temperature checks. So if they don't have a fever, we allow them to come in. But a fever is not going to necess necessitate that you're going to have other symptoms or you're going to have other symptoms, but maybe not have a fever. So the temperature check, although it's good, it is definitely an added measure. It's not the only measure that you can use. Yeah, and I guess part of the challenge is that uh... You know, each health department can interpret the, the, the rules differently. So, you know, it'd be nice to have a, a provincial standard. And I think, uh, Evan, you know, the, the provincial uh, medical officer of health obviously has, has the, the ultimate control or, or power, but, uh, but each, each health unit seems to be able to set their own regulations, which Doug probably makes it, it difficult because in, you know, in, in Peel, it may be different than in Halton. If, if I may, I, I'm, I, I would agree in the sense that um, consistency is key here. You don't want confusion depending on where, where you go. Um, and, and I guess part of what I would default back to, as I think, I think Doug quite correctly uh, noted, is um, the, qu the questions that can be asked. Uh, you can use that self-screening tool that the province has set forward as that benchmark, um, because some of the questions there obviously relate directly to predetermining or hopefully detecting um, an early onset of, of uh, symptoms that relate to COVID-19. So um, those, those I think would be great in terms of just something that you can ask employees as they're, as they're coming in, however, through whatever means you, you see fit. Um, but again, in terms of that, that overall consistency, that is th th those questions come from um, the chief medical officer of health and, and obviously the experts around the, the COVID-19 command table. So um, yeah, we do, I would agree in the sense that, you know, maybe there does need to be a little bit more emphasis on these are the parameters that need to be asked across the board. Um, but as it relates maybe to the purposes of this call, I, I think, you know, if there are concerns around privacy or, um, you know, giving too much sensitive information out to um, to the employer from the employee that again, those, those self-assessment quest questions would, uh, would be of, of benefit and, and would be a good resource. 
and Doug, you probably saw it, but we had somebody post saying they've adjusted their questionnaire wording to include symptoms should not be chronic or related to other known causes or conditions. So, so I think um, I know for myself, there's certain times throughout the year where I have allergies, my allergies flare up, you get a runny nose, you might be sneezing, things like that. Um, if you're seeing that you have the same symptoms around the same time, it's one of those things where chances are it's not going to be a symptom of COVID in a sense. It's just your normal allergies or it could be some people talk about post nasal drip and things like that too, where it's something that they have. Um, if you find that you're having symptoms outside of those normal times, if you find that you have a new symptom, then that's when you need to consider the idea and you should probably go get tested at that point. Um, I don't know, maybe Evan might have a bit of extra on that, but that's kind of my understanding is that if you have allergies, there's a good chance that if you're having the normal allergy during that time of year, so fall, spring, whatever, chances are you probably don't have COVID unless you have a symptom that isn't normal to what you normally have. Um, yeah, I, I, I would agree wholeheartedly. I mean, I, everybody, if you do have allergies, I mean, yeah, you tend to know the onset and what it feels like and when it typically does tend to occur. I would say um, maybe, maybe two major points. Um, even if you are fairly certain it's, um, say, allergy related, as, as the example, um, there should still be an emphasis on, on isolating and keeping yourself at home, um, working from home, obviously, if that is an option for, for you or for your employees, that should be the option taken. Um, just for an abundance, just out of an abundance of caution. I mean, there's no need to sound alarmist here, but um, unfortunately you you hope for the best, but but plan for the worst kind of thing. Um, so in that particular instance, again, I would I would certainly say that um, isolating would be the the name of the game, regardless of, of this situation. Um, I think the the second piece that I would probably want to reiterate to it, and as I think Doug was was trying to, to highlight, is this this distinction needs to be made between improving symptoms and persistent or worsening symptoms. So yeah, you know, I, I think as it relates to um, <coughs> you know, the workplace or even students going to school, you know, the runny nose, the cough, it's flu season, it's allergy season, these things are going to come up. And again, it doesn't um, mean that you have COVID-19. Um, but it does mean that we need to be a little bit more aware in terms of our actions and how we are feeling. Because again, if that cough starts to get a little bit better within a few days, or that runny nose starts to clear up, um, you know, I think there is a little bit of a green light and I don't think there is a necessity to necessarily go get tested. Again, you should still be isolating out of that abundance of caution, but the necessity to, to, to say get tested, I don't think is there. That being said, um, again, as I think Doug noted, if you, this is allergy season and usually get the stuffed up nose, but all of a sudden that, that sense of smell starts to go away, the fever starts to hit, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, horrible worst case scenario, some difficulties breathing, et cetera, that would be an instance where those symptoms are worsening. Um, and they are being persistent. And in this particular example, I would recommend going to get a COVID test and obviously isolating until you get the results and continue to be practical in terms of uh, keeping yourself at home. Doug, I wanted to kind of, unless you want to jump in on that, I'm going to go to another question, Doug. Um, no, I, I'm good, actually. I think we kind of covered what needed to be covered. So I know Keith mentioned uh, he had made his changes. I just kind of mentioned, just make sure that you add the persistent or worsening symptoms to that statement. And, um, you should have everything covered that you need to cover for that first question. So I'm going to switch to the fines, Doug. You talked uh, a lot about uh, the fines that are in place and, and mm -hmm. some of them quite significant, but you've also talked about uh, some companies that you know that have been fined. Are there certain areas that are consistent, certain themes that, uh, that people should look out for? Um, the one thing that I've seen with regards to orders has been, the biggest thing has been physical distancing. Um, and it could be in lunch rooms and break areas. Uh, a lot of companies haven't, they haven't really necessarily done enough. So the inspectors have come in and they've basically issued an order of non-compliance and asked them to, make sure that they take all reasonable measures. So that could be in a lunchroom, you may have tables set up where you basically put tape over certain parts of that table so that say on one side, there's one person and on the other side, there's two, but they're spread out at the ends of the table. And then that way you get your 
six feet of distance. Um, it could be they go in, they've walked in to a facility and there's been 25 people in this room that probably barely holds 10 for a break. And it could just be using a coffee machine. It could be using the fridge or something like that. And implementing measures so that there's only one person in that room at a time or only two people in that room at a time. You must maintain six feet. And you must have a mask on unless you are only taking a drink or eating something. Um, those are kind of the standard things right now. The signage, the signage has also been an issue and usually it's just in order to, um, order to put up more signs and they'll advise which signs they wanna see. In regards to fines, I mean, I've seen fines, um, I've seen fines more in health and safety in general. And a lot of those is usually the result of someone unfortunately losing their life on a job site or in a business. And those are where you find those really large fines. My philosophy has always been, regardless of whether I'm working with a client that's been in that situation or a client that hasn't seen that yet is all businesses and all owners work hard for their money. And if you're not going to take the measures that they've asked you to take, why is it that you want to risk losing that kind of money? Why is it like you can look at it from a worker safety standpoint, and that is paramount, but a lot of business owners will also look at it from a financial perspective. And as a business owner, I don't like to spend money. I don't have to spend. So if it means I have to do something to prevent being fined for something like that, then I'm going to do it because I like to keep the money that I actually do get to keep. A lot of uh, small businesses are, are tenants within buildings. So, you know, some people are wondering what, what's, what's the responsibility of the landlord and what's the responsibility of the tenant? If, uh, if it's a common area, if it's a common washroom, can the, can the tenant be liable for not having sanitizer in the washroom or not cleaning enough in, in common areas? When you say like common washroom, is it a common to the building or is it common just to the... To the building. So I would say when it's a common element to the entire building, then it would be up to the landlord to make sure that those items are in there. If it's one tenant within that entire building, then I think the onus could be put on to the tenant to make sure that they have the necessary measures in place. But I believe there's still like um, areas for that where it has to do with the agreement that you have with your landlord. Right. Um, so that something like that, I would probably go a little farther and say it'd be better to speak with a lawyer who specializes in tenant and landlords issues. You could also contact public health Public health would probably be able to provide you answers on that as well, or even the Ministry of Labor could provide you answers on that. But if you don't want to go that route, you could obviously go through a lawyer who specializes in those areas. Or you can go through Doug Suley. Well, you could go through me too. Um, but again, that area specifically is not really like an expertise of mine. So if I, if there is an area I'm not so sure of, then that is usually my the best option to use. The government will provide information to you. They're not just gonna look at it and say, well, we're gonna come in and we're gonna mess you up or anything like that. If you're calling with a legitimate question and asking, um, they will answer the questions for you. And everything's, especially with the Ministry of Labor, everything is anonymous when you call their contact number. Uh, you don't have to provide your name. I know some people like to block their number before they call so that they can't figure out who's calling, but if you'd like to do that, you could do that too, but it is anonymous um, and it is a worker contact, but employers can also contact. But coming back to, uh, to your services, you've talked about uh, do, you know, doing site inspections. Mm -hmm. I think some people assume that, that that's only for larger companies, but, um, but I'm assuming that, uh, that small businesses could benefit uh, from having an inspection as well. I think small businesses, small businesses is where I actually concentrate on. Um, so a lot of small businesses will find, um, if you look at say a construction company, for example, they may have a couple of managers who are work out of an office and then they may have sites satellite throughout all the, like throughout the city and they can't get to the sites all the time. 
And where they find the value in my site inspection is they'll send me out to kind of let them know what's going on when they're not there. And all those are all, in a lot of cases with those, they are actually anonymous. Um, I do advise the management, but I don't tell anybody on site that I'm coming. And the purpose of it is in some cases, some company, some of my clients have used it as preparation for if the ministry was going to show up to kind of give them an idea and prepare them so that worst case, if an inspector shows up, they know, okay, I need to do this. I need to provide this. I need to make sure I show this. I need to follow what the inspector is saying. So they've seen a lot of value in that sort of avenue of it, but I think it's a good idea with the sites or even facilities. It could be something as quick as coming in and doing a quick check on where you're currently at. Um, it is a service I do offer. If you'd like more information on that, I'd be please feel free to contact me. I'd be happy to come out and discuss any questions that you have. Oh, that's um, so if, if I may chime in as well, and, and forgive me that I'm not trying to plug your, your business, Doug, but just to reiterate the value of something like that, um, I, I can certainly attest to the Ministry of Labor um, and their emphasis on following these guidelines. Um, I think the, the note was mentioned earlier on that we, that we have hired uh, 98 or 99 new uh, labor inspectors. Um, and sorry, I was just looking up the notes, so forgive me, I am reading from a screen, <laughs> but um, it says right now, the, um, this is the, uh, the, this, the hiring of these 99 people is the largest increase in 15 years, um, and their inspectorate is now uh, the largest it's ever been with, a hunt, with 507 full-time permanent inspectors once all these hirings are done. So um, again, it's important to be cognizant of this fact, uh, not that the Ministry of Labor is coming to get you, but at the same time, there is a greater potential now more than ever for an inspector to come knocking and just to make sure that everything, everything is safe and good to go. And I have seen them with my clients actually coming in. Uh, they have started to come in to, yeah. they're getting more frequent in regards to coming in. So it's best to be prepared and it's best to put together what needs to be put into place and be ready because they will be coming. 100%. Uh, Doug, before we close, uh, there's a question around uh, how often people should change their masks. So if you're wearing a non-surgical mask, you're, you're working even at a desk for eight hours, you know, you should be changing it, uh, you know, halfway through the day. What's when it comes to non-surgical, um, it's kind of more a little bit hearsay on what I'm going to go with here. But if you do take your mask off and if you put it down or something like that, then you shouldn't be putting it back on. Okay. Um, if you are going to take it off to eat, I know in some, my wife, for example, she works in this peel board. Um, she's an EA and I believe they give them is I think it's like five or six masks or something or maybe 10 masks a week and they advise them that once you've taken your mask off to eat or anything like that you should change those masks at that point if you're wearing a face covering um, I would suggest if it's possible wash it daily as best as you can um, if you do take it off the important thing that I like because I wear a a reusable mask myself and I always make sure that I make sure I either wash my hands or sanitize before I put it on before I take it off and then actually once I've taken it off as well so I go a little overboard some might say but um, that's kind of where I look at it and if I'm going to take it off I'm going to make sure I'm not putting it down on a desk or I'm not putting it down in like maybe my own car or something like that I'll put it in there but not down on a desk where anybody else is around because that kind of, for me, in my mind, that increases my potential exposure at that point. So I would say if you're going to use the non-surgical, then I would change it every time you take it off. Um, I believe that's what they're kind of really designed for is if they do get wet, if they get dirty or anything like that, then at that point, they're also useless and need to be taken off and changed. Yeah, that's great. That's all the questions we have. So, uh, Doug, any final final parting comments? Um, the only comments I have is, you know, I hope that everyone out there stays safe, um, stay healthy, protect your workers, 
And really, if you protect your workers, then you're going to protect yourself as well from a liability standpoint. And if you have any questions or anything like that at all, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to answer any questions for chamber members, non-chamber members, and look forward to hearing from you. Perfect. Thanks, Doug. Evan, any, anything from your side? Um, no, I would, I would certainly reiterate what, what Doug was saying. I mean, want to wish everybody the best and, and obviously stay healthy and well. Um, I know part of what our office has tried to do, what the MPP Gill has tried to do is put together a, a business list, um, just an email list, because we are doing our best to send out updates and um, everything else that might be pertinent to, to your industry um, as regularly and as frequently as we can. So if there is any interest there, always feel free to reach out to the office. Um, or maybe, sorry to, to add to Scott's to-do list, but to the chamber as well. And I'm sure they'd be happy to, to be direct them, direct you to us. So um, one way or another, as I mentioned, if there's any interest in that, feel free to, to reach out and we'd be happy to provide you with some of those resources as they continue to come online and, and uh, be available. Yeah, I mean, if there's a positive to, uh, to the pandemic, it's the fact that, uh, that everyone is working really closely together. So, uh, you know, chamber members, the chamber, um, the, the political uh, staff and, and the politicians. So, so really the community has come together as a whole. So, you know, if you're contacting one person, you're really contacting the, uh, the whole community for help. So, so that's-, that's Ontario great. spirit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Again, the, uh, the webinar is going to be on the Chamber website if you need any of the links. And uh, uh, Evan and Doug, I want to thank you on behalf of uh, everyone that's watching uh, for, for your expertise and uh, and thanks to everyone for tuning into another COVID conversation. That's it for this episode. Thank you. Thank Pleasure. you for having me. Take thanks. care.